Welcome. This is our conversation about important projects happening in the city of Holyoke. And for this occasion, we have in here Mayor Joshua Garcia, and also we have the Director of the Office for Community Development for the City of Holyoke, Alicia Soler, and also joining us, Holyoke City Engineer, Robert Parent. Welcome, thank you for being here. We are gonna be talking about important projects happening in the city and all of them related to federal funding sources available for the city of Holyoke. So thank you so much for making the time to talk about this important informative process and developments happening in the city. And I would like to welcome all of you and the space is yours. Thank you so much, Johan. And I do want to thank Alicia and Bob for making time to participate uh, in this event here. What we're trying to do just for the folks that are watching, there's a lot of projects happening throughout the city. And what we want to do here is try to communicate as much as possible what those projects are so that people know uh, what we're doing here to keep up with the several quality of life issues we're tackling in the city of Hoyoke. It certainly is a very uh, a unique time for the city. There are several different funding sources we're juggling from the FY21 Community Development Block Grants uh, funds, as well as the FY19 CDBG CV COVID uh, uh, related, um, which Alicia can uh, uh, talk a little bit about. And each of those respectively are about $1.2 million. Uh, FY21 Home Consortium at $918,593. There's also the FY21 Home ARP Consortium at $3.3 million. And funding we're getting through the uh, that we have been receiving and continuing looking forward to get another, uh, another round through the American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA money at the federal allocation, $29,894,000. And then the county allocation, Supplementing that seven million seven hundred ninety-two thousand two hundred fifty-seven dollars. Um, so there's a great deal of um, uh, funding sources uh, being directed here in our city, and both Alicia and our city engineer Bob Parent have been doing a tremendous uh, amount of work, on outstanding, uh, to say the least, um, in juggling this and trying to get these projects from start to finish. And as you can realize, and, and you'll hear a little bit uh, from Alicia and Bob, there's a great deal of work that happens from the planning to design phase to procurement phase, all the way to actual implementation and construction phase. Uh, uh, so um, uh, with that said, I, I'll, I'll pass it to um, Alicia, who can, I guess, go forward with um, uh, some of the work that she's doing, and maybe we can even uh, get a conversation rolling. And if at all, Johan, you want to ask any questions in between, uh, by all means. But the, the key purpose here is try to be as transparent and communicative as possible um, to the public to understand what we have going on, what people can expect, and uh, what challenges um, we're going through to manage some of this, um, which I think we can uh, talk a little, about, a little bit about uh, later on. So there's definitely a lot of pros to be excited about. But on the city side, there's definitely challenges internally we're navigating to keep up uh, with these projects. And, and I hope we can talk about that as well. Excellent, thank you, Mayor. Um, so the first topic that we wanna cover this morning um, is on housing development. Um, certainly housing, healthy, safe, affordable housing for all of our residents, um, regardless of their economic background, their standing in life, their age, their location is one of the key highlights for the city of Holyoke. And we recognize that we have a need for diverse housing choices and opportunities. We have uh, families in the Highlands who may be starting to age out of their homes and looking for opportunities to downsize. We have families in a number of our subsidized housing units that are improving their household incomes and looking to buy their first homes. We have singles that wanna move into the community and perhaps start their careers here, either in our um, marijuana industry or in our arts communities. And so we recognize that a diversity of housing choices is critical. 
One of the factors that we take into consideration when we're looking at our housing developments is that 68% of our residents are currently what we consider low and moderate income. And those are households where a household of one is making about $45,000 a year. So we recognize that when we have a household in the low and moderate income category, we need to make sure that our housing choices reflect the affordability. We want homeowners and renters to be successful. Um, I'm gonna go over a few of our current housing developments. Um, and it's important here that we stop and we pause and recognize our strong community partners. Um, we would not, we the city would not be able to advance these housing developments without our strong, strong development partners um, that are local for the most part. The first one, uh, the first category that I wanna to touch on is our owner occupied housing developments. Holyoke is described as what uh, is described as being upside down in terms of its renter versus homeowner portfolio. We have about 60% renter and 40% homeowner. Um, and so we know we need to increase the number of homeowner units across all income levels. Uh, in terms of the public funding um, that's being allocated towards housing developments, the Greater Springfield Habitat hum for Humanity received $355,000 in ARPA funds, and they're gonna be building a couple of new owner-occupied first-time homeowner units in the area of Jackson Street. One Holyoke CDC received $355,000 in ARPA funds for homeownership development, and they're gonna be developing a number of homes in the area of Walnut Street. One Holyoke recently signed a contract to finish up the work at 278 Pine Street, uh, folks in the community will remember that 278 Pine Street was a very large block that had been vacant and abandoned. It was demolished by the city and one Holyoke stepped forward to move the old Yankee Peddler house to the location at 278 Pine Street. So we're hoping that that work is going to wrap up in the next few months and that we'll have a new owner occupant as well as a rental unit at that location. The Holyoke Housing Authority has been aggressively working in South Holyoke, and we look forward to partnering with them with $1.3 million in ARPA funds to bring on South Holyoke Phase 2, which is going to provide 19 units of homeownership in South Holyoke, an area that currently has very, very few owner occupants. And we think that providing the owner occupant and homeownership opportunities, families that are currently in South Holyoke will have other housing choices. Also supporting owner-occupied housing, we provide up to $4,999 in down payment assistance through our Buyer's Assistance Program to first-time home buyers. That's administered by the Holyoke Housing Authority. As the prices of real estate in Holyoke have gone up, that down payment assistance is becoming a critical bridge to folks being able to buy their first homes. And then anytime we have an opportunity to work with developers to convert rental properties to home ownership, uh, particularly in some of the neighborhoods um, that had been traditionally rental, we look to do those. So for instance, we had a developer on Maple Street who rehabbed four of the rental units that were across the street from the library. And those condominiums have now been converted to home ownership opportunities for first time home buyers. In the area of rental housing, it's really exciting times. Um, over the next three years, we expect about 300 new rental units to come online. Those rental units occur, are across all income spectrums. Um, most key in this are 216 new units that are coming online at the Appleton Mills at 216 Appleton Street with Wynn Development. And we expect 41 new rental units at the Library Commons Phase Two um, with Wayfinders. In terms of owner-occupied housing rehab, looking to develop new housing opportunities is just one piece of what we do. We also want to make sure that folks that are currently in their homes have the resources to ensure that their homes remain safe, sanitary, and healthy housing, um, healthy housing, healthy housing for the families. Um, so we offer a couple of opportunities for that through the neighborhood homeowner neighborhood improvement program. We can provide up to $10,000 in a grant to home owner occupants, and they can use that funding for things like HVAC improvements, roofs, windows. If someone gets an, a notice from their insurance company that there's a problem with the house, we can help them uh, repair the house for those. Any kind of code violations, sewer issues, water issues, we're able to provide up to $10,000 in a grant. Um, and then the next piece that we've been working on is with the Holyoke Fire Department, and that's the installation of the Knox boxes. So if you're a homeowner who lives alone and you're concerned that in the event of a medical emergency that someone wouldn't be able to get into your home, 
you can partner with the Holyoke Fire Department and they will come out free of charge to you and install a box that your house key will then um, be put in. And then when there's a medical emergency in your home, the fire department shows up and they can access this locked box to get into your home without having to bang down the door or cause any housing damage. So that's been a very successful um, program to date. And finally, in the area of rental housing rehab, again, making sure that our renters are living in healthy housing. We have 150,000 of ARPA funds uh, that's been set aside for loans and grants to rental housing improvements for occupied units. And so again, rental property owners can access funding for things like HVAC, windows, doors, security, lighting, lead-based paint abatement, sewer improvements, water improvements, that sort of thing. The Rental Neighborhood Improvement Program is a rolling application revolving loan fund. So those applications are always available. That funding is um, consistently in place. So I would encourage any owner occupants or rental property owners who are in need of assistance to please reach out to our office. And with that, I think I'm gonna toss it to Bob um, to touch on some of the, the road work that we're working on, unless there's any questions. Well, that's another thing too, is I, I, I failed to include that also another funding source uh, that Bob is going to talk a little bit about is the chapter 90 that we get through the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and um, uh, that, you know, obviously is supporting many of the, the road improvement related projects, but go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mayor. You're correct. Um, as you alluded to, the DPW does a lot of things that um, rely on funding that go beyond federal funding programs. Chapter 90 is one of the important funding programs. There are a couple of others that I'll reference as I go through my discussion. Um, roadways, very important. You know, most people, you know, probably one of their biggest complaints that they have in communities are roadways and the conditions of the roadways. And we do what we can to keep them maintained. The city of Holyoke owns 138, 138 miles of public roadway. Uh, we, for the first time in 2019, implemented a pavement management system where we went out and we actually assessed every roadway in the city at a 10-foot increment. So every single 10-foot section of roadway was photographed. It was uh, analyzed using computer algorithms to give it a rating of one to five, and that then created our pavement management system. And what we're doing these days is trying to use that pavement management system to create a more systematic approach to the roadways that we maintain. Uh, they're very poor roadways. We need to bring them up to current condition, and the, the roadways that are in good condition, there are maintenance-type activities that we can do to keep them in pretty good condition. Um, chapter 90 uh, is traditionally been the single biggest source of funding for roadway improvements in the city of Holyoke and most Massachusetts communities. We receive a little bit over a million dollars of Chapter 90 funding from the state every year. That typically translates to two to three miles of roadway improvements, uh, depending on the width of the roadway and the type of improvements that are being made. Um, in this coming fiscal year, fiscal 22, uh, we have targeted 2.8 miles of roadway improvements. The roadways that are on that list uh, that will be worked on this year include Edwood Drive, Martin Street, West Glen Street, which we did a portion of that work this last fall uh, because they have significant icing problems there typically in the springtime, so we wanted to make certain that was taken care of. Appermont Highway uh, from the top of Westfield Road down to Rock Valley. Rock Valley, the segment from Southampton Road to the city line, probably one of the worst roadways we have in the city right now. Green Willow Drive, McClellan Street, Village Road, Ross Road, and Lenox Road. Um, and then we have targets looking forward to the next two or three years, but we typically update those targets on an annual basis because things change and priorities change. One thing that we try to do on our roadway work is we try to leverage other funding sources and other projects as well. Um, Holyoke Gas and Electric does a lot of work in the city. Holyoke Waterworks does a lot of work in the city. And a couple of projects I want to call attention to that we've been able to leverage funding to get more road repaving work done were about a half mile of roadway improvements that were done as part of the Phase 1 water improvements project in the flats. That was on North Bridge, Eli, Northeast, and East White that was done this spring or last spring, spring of 2021. 
Uh, we have a lot of paving work that is going to be done this spring, early summer in the South Holyoke area, basically all the roadways between Main Street and South Canal Street. Um, as it loops around up to Cabot, will be repaved as part of two projects, as part of the South Holyoke Homes project that was funded by Mass Works, and as part of the ongoing Jackson Street sewer project that is nearing completion. Um, so South Holyoke, uh, six to nine months from now, will look quite a bit different than it does today. We are also, um, Holyoke Waterworks has a large water improvements project that will be starting this year. Uh, that in, actually, no, sorry, their, their phase 2A project, which is on Fairfield and Morgan Street and in that general area, as well as some work on Pleasant and some work on Nonatuck. They will be repaving about a mile of roadway as part of that project that will be completed this spring, summer. And then their upcoming project, um, their phase 2B project, involves about 1.5 miles of road repaving. And that will include Portland and Magnolia, Dwight and Hamden. The work will be ongoing this year and next year, and the repaving will likely be next year and then the following year. So again, we try to leverage as much as we can to get as much done as possible and work with our fellow partners in the city. Uh, then, And one a fairly unique thing that we did from a roadway standpoint this year was that the city council um, appropriated local funding for repaving of Northampton Street. Um, so that work was actually done this last fall uh, with city funds. That did not involve any state funds or any federal funds. That's roadways in Holyoke in a snapshot. Um, Another type of improvements that we're working on right now is traffic light improvements. City Council funded um, $1.8 million to make improvements at 12 locations in the city back in 2019. We, working with the Fire Department Signals Division, who's implementing most of the work and they're doing a great job, um, have completed um, eight out of the 12 and we have four more ahead of us. The four more ahead of us for this year are a brand new traffic signal on Appermont Highway at the top of the hill, excuse me, on Westfield Road at the top of the hill where Appermont comes in. A uh, very difficult location to try to pull out into traffic, so the goal there is to make that intersection much safer uh, by putting in a traffic light there. Um, and then replacing equipment at Pleasant and Hampton Street and Lin Linden and Hampton and uh, Lincoln and Pleasant as well. That's traffic lights. Sidewalks. Sidewalks historically we've received community development block grant funding uh, courtesy of Alicia and her department uh, to complete sidewalk replacement over the years. That typically is a relatively modest amount of funding. We typically get something around a half mile to a mile of sidewalks done every year. Um, this current federal fiscal year we have about a half mile of work. Um, on our list of which we've completed a portion and we're looking to complete the remainder of it in the springtime. Uh, we did work on Woods Ave, we did work on Norwood Terrace, uh, we have work upcoming on Worcester Place, Chestnut Street at the end by Franklin and Sargent, uh, some select portions of sidewalk on Lyman Street that are in very poor shape, and then also some work on East Dwight that will be coming up in the springtime. Again, a fairly unique occurrence for the City of Holyoke. The, um, City Council appropriated $1.2 million uh, for sidewalk replacement projects this last fall. Uh, we're nearing that project to get ready to go out to bid. That's about 2.4 miles of sidewalk improvement. And that includes sidewalk improvements on Brown Ave, Westfield Road, uh, a limited area from Michigan uh, past the I-91 crossing up to Woodland, um, Clark Street, Gilman Street, Wyckoff, Highland, Vadnais, Princeton, and Jefferson. Um, and then I, I forgot to mention this, again, leveraging funding as part of the South Holyoke Homes Project. We expect to be replacing most of the uh, very poor sidewalks in the South Holyoke area. There are some places where the, sol the high sidewalks are in, in, in reasonably good shape. We won't be touching those but either the ones that are being upgraded as part of the overall infrastructure improvement projects or even sidewalks that extend beyond the footprint of the project will be getting replaced as part of that ongoing project. Feel free, folks, to tell me to, to, to speed up if you'd like. Um, 
They're doing great. One thing you've seen in the city of Holyoke over the last really year and a half, two years, is some traffic calming and pedestrian safety measures. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a number of those that, that many folks may have seen. Uh, for the first time, we constructed raised crosswalks as one as a pedestrian safety measure and as a traffic calming measure. We put in two of those on West Franklin Street, two of them on Main Street at the Dean School. Their second one is, is um, nearing um, completion in the springtime. We put in two on Westfield Road at Mayor Field. Um, also, as part of the South Polio Combs project, there will be two raised crosswalks installed uh, by Carlos Vega Park, one on Clemente and one on um, Southeast Street. And then, because they appear to be very effective and there appears to be community support for them, we're applying for mass DOT funding for additional raised crosswalk work. We don't know if we're going to receive it yet or not, but the, the locations we have targeted right now would be two on Sargent Street at very similar locations as the ones that we put on West Franklin Street. Um, two in Homestead at the McMahon School location at Kane and Pinchon, and um, again, leveraging and, and tying into everything else that we're talking about to support the wind redevelopment of the far alpaca mills, we're looking at targeting two raised crosswalks on the lower section of Appleton Street, uh, where there will be much greatly increased pedestrian activity as a result of that redevelopment. Then lastly, on pedestrian safety, uh, residents may see that we've installed a number of what is known as rapid flashing beacons or pedestrian beacons that we really encourage people to use um, in an attempt to try to make crosswalks much safer. Uh, press the button when you want to cross the street and the lights will flash and, and you get a much greater chance that drivers will see you than if you just attempt to walk across the street without using the, the equipment that has been installed. Again, using the uh, working with the fire department signal division, they have installed all the equipment for the DPW. So we've put beacons at the senior center at Pine and Beach Street, uh, two at Dean School, two on Homestead, uh, two at Westfield Road at the Rates Crosswalks, uh, two at West Franklin, one at Springdale Ave down by Springdale Park. We have uh, one going in at the Holyoke Community College campus entrance in the spring. We put one at, on Hamden Street by the Stop and Shop at the crossing there, uh, one at Lincoln Street, um, and one on Main Street. Um, and again, these projects, the traffic calming has been a combination of local funding, there was some city council money, um, and mass DOT funding. They have a fairly unique program that they call their Shared Street Program, where they're trying to encourage usage of streets not only by drivers, but by death, pedestrians and bicyclists. And through that program, we've been able to fund some of these um, improvement measures. And lastly, um, by no means least, but uh, probably a, a quicker discussion is some of the uh, sewer and stormwater improvements that are either ongoing or will be upcoming um, in the very near future. Uh, we have the Jackson Street Sewer Separation Project. That's a $9 million project. Uh, funded through a combination of state funding and local funding through a long-term low-interest loan. Um, that'll be wrapping up this summer. Um, and as I talked about, there's going to be a lot of improvements made as part of that project that go beyond just the, the sewer improvements. Uh, we have an upcoming project that has been funded through the ARPA program known as the Springdale Pond Drain Relocation Project. That is a, uh, since the 1950s, um, there is a large pond area behind the industrial area um, in the Springdale neighborhood uh, between like, yeah, right, Berkshire Street, I think it is. Berkshire Street wraps around the backside. That pond back in the 50s was connected to the city's uh, sewer system because at that point the sewer system went into the river and it didn't really matter. Uh, well, it matters very much today because that water coming out of the pond goes directly into our sewer system. It gets treated at the wastewater treatment plant. When we have high flows, it adds to the amount of overflows of, of combined sewage that goes to the Connecticut River. So uh, we've received $700,000 of funding uh, to eliminate that source and tie it directly into a storm drain so that it'll go directly to the Connecticut River and reduce, reduce operating costs as well as reducing uh, sewer overflows. Um, and that work will be ongoing uh, this spring and summer, really uh, 
relatively little impact to residents, but great benefit to residents because it's primarily going to be in the industrial park area on Garfield Street, Bollier Street, tying into a pipeline on Main Street. I um, mean, the last thing, what's, what's ahead of us right now is our next big uh, sewer separation project. Um, it's in what we call the River Terrace area, which really encompasses what's known as the Bemis Heights neighborhood. Bemis Street and Bemis Road and all of the, the, the side streets around Bemis Road that, that connect to Bemis Road. It also includes the Central Park neighborhood, the Mountain View neighborhood, and all the cross streets off of, off of Mountain View. And then on the other side of Northampton Street, um, it crosses over into River Terrace, uh, Vadnais, George, Hampton Knowles area, et cetera. That is a very large project that currently has an estimated cost of about $16 million, $16 million. Uh, we are hopeful that one, either federal infrastructure funding will help to reduce the cost of that project. If that's the case, perhaps it'll move, move forward a little bit sooner. But if not, we would, we would expect that it would be funded in a similar manner as the uh, Jackson Street project with a reduced, own, reduced interest loan and a portion of state funding. If that's the case, that's probably three to five years out. Again, if federal infrastructure funding becomes advantageous, maybe that schedule moves forward a little bit faster. And last and by no means least, uh, for the first time I think ever, or the first time in a long time, uh, the city has been able to utilize funding through the ARPA program to do not only sewer separation work, which is important and mandated by the EPA, but also fixing our existing sewer system. We have some pipes in the downtown area that's over, that are over 100 years old, and when they fail and we have to fix them after the fact, they are much, much, much more expensive to fix. So we're able to use a little bit over $2 million of ARPA funding and CDBG money to assess those pipes, or at least a portion of those pipes, and uh, go through what they call a process of lining it. Basically, you put a pipe inside of the existing pipe that is much, much less costly than tearing up the roads and disrupting everything, and basically restores the life of the pipeline back to its original 75 to 100 year lifespan such that we should not have any problems to worry about in those areas for a long time. So that's it for my piece right now, if that's okay. Well, uh, engineer, thank you so much for this uh, really broad reporting on everything that is happening in the city. And it has been happening for, for a while in some of these projects because they take time and a lot of work, especially considering those are projects that are needed and some of them having uh, overdue for different reasons and fortunately are happening now. I think this is a really important moment to acknowledge every single effort being done and under under your your view for for making sure that all the different pieces that make the city work are in place and ready to operate and continue working in order to provide a better quality of life for the residents in the city so i want to thank you for this report i think it's really important for for everyone to know what is happening, even if sometimes it's hard to see all the hard work happening. Oh, it doesn't stop there, Johan. It doesn't stop there. I mean, I think mm -hmm. what we heard so far right now is uh, um, the subject area of housing, uh, roads, traffic lights, sidewalk replacements, traffic calming and pedestrian safety improvements, soar, soar and stormwater um, projects. And I think Alicia has um some items she wanted to touch upon around economic development and then uh as well as some other activities going on going on being planned for our parks and public facilities um Delisha, did you want to talk a little bit about or start that sure i'd be happy to thanks mayor um so the office for community development is actually the conduit for the federal funds um that come into the city so we administer and manage um, the CDBG program, the home program, and currently the ARPA program. The city does have a, a well-staffed, comprehensive Office of Planning and Economic Development that works with developers here in the city. 
Um, so I'm going to touch on economic development, but I want to make sure that it's clear that when I'm touching on economic development, it's not economic development that's happening across the city. These are economic development um, programs that are funded by this office. Uh, I'm sure that the mayor will be doing a future session with um, Aaron Vega and the Office of Planning and Economic Development um, for a more comprehensive view of what's happening. Um, in terms of programs that are funded through this office, we do have a couple that support um, small businesses in town. The first one is the Facade Improvement Program. It was a program that was started a number of years ago and um, the funding languished. There was just, the interest was not there in taking advantage of it. Um, the Facade Improvement Program offers grants to businesses in the downtown district, mainly along um, our downtown high traffic areas of High, Maple, and Main Streets, but we certainly would look outside of those streets if someone was interested. Last year, we did make an investment of 35000 in community development block grant funds, and that program is going to open in the next few weeks for the spring construction season, and we'll be taking applications from business owners wanting to do exterior improvements or what's known as facade improvements. So those things might be reestablishing the historic natures of the storefront, um, taking off some of the, the boarding that may have been done over time and, and rediscovering the leaded glass windows and the transoms. It may be repointing the brick, uh, doing new awnings and siding, uh, signage, that sort of thing. Um, we did do two facade improvement programs in the last uh, few years, and folks will recognize Gateway City Arts at 92 Ray Street uh, received a grant to do all new windows to improve their facade, as well as Whitman Properties at 121 Main Street. If folks remember, originally, uh, before Whitman Properties took over that building, the windows had been removed and bricked up. And so what Whitman did was uh, remove the windows, reinstall glass windows in the building, do some exterior uh, repointing of the brickwork, and now it's really looking great down there on Main Street. Um, our next small business support is we provided 800,000 in ARPA funds to small businesses and those in the hospitality, travel, and tourism sector. Those grants were designed to assist businesses and hospitality, travel, and tourism entities with overcoming the effects of COVID. To date, we've provided 22 small businesses here in the city of Holyoke with grant funds, generally up to about 25,000. We have a range of businesses from restaurants to bars, um, to bakeries, to gyms, um, beauty parlors, all kinds of things. We've also provided two tourism related grants, um, one to Wisteria Hearst Museum and one to the International Volleyball Hall of Fame. I'm hoping that in that next round of ARPA, we'll see another significant investment in our small businesses. I know right now the demand far outweighs the 800,000 that we had initially supported. The other piece of small business support that we're offering is we are partnering with Spark um, through an ARPA funding allocation to offer a business accelerator. So those folks who are at home, maybe during the pandemic, baking cookies, uh, doing something in their kitchens at home with home businesses, we're gonna provide funding to enable them to grow um, and really establish themselves as a small business here in the city of Holyoke. Um, we also have $90,000 available in our community development COVID funding for small business. That's funding that's um, geared towards businesses that are owned or those who employ low and moderate income um, residents. And that program is open. If someone's interested, please reach out to our office um, and we can talk about you know, the best grant funding for you. Um, again, all of these investments are working towards the goal of making Holyoke an amazing place to work, live and play. And uh, you've heard about working in Holyoke, you've heard about living in Holyoke, you've heard about our, our infrastructure. And so I'm gonna toss it to Bob to talk about the investments that we're making it to make Holyoke a cool place to play. Bob? Thank you, Alicia. Um, the DPW City Engineer, we really serve as a support entity to the Parks and Rec Department. Uh, we maintain the facilities, we help them improve the facilities, but they run the facilities, they manage them, they do a great job. So I'm gonna talk primarily about the, the infrastructure piece of parks facilities. Um, Typically, the infrastructure is improvements are funded either through community development block grants, um, again, Alicia's department, uh, through the Community Preservation Act funding, which is a relatively new program that's been available for the past couple of years in the city, 
and some great things are being ha are being funded through that program. And this year, there was a city council appropriation that also affected um, a portion of the city's recreation and parks facilities. Um, I'm going to mention Pool Yacht Pool largely because it was a big project. It was actually funded with state funding as well as city funded. We got it reopened for the first time in, in July of 2021. Um, if everything went very well, and I strongly encourage residents to get out and to use it you know, during this upcoming summer that we're all looking forward to. So that one is behind us. Um, we did complete with CDBG funding a master plan for Springdale Park. We identified multiple phases uh, that then could be of improvements that could then serve as the basis of requesting funding from state agencies, federal agencies to put some of those improvements in place over a number of years. Um, this last year, we uh, received funding to replace the spray park at Pena Park um, in the flats. Uh, the work is about 99.9% .9 complete. We just have a couple of benches and tables that were were uh, back ordered because of supply chain issues that hopefully will be installed in the next month or two, but that's ready to go for this upcoming season. Uh, Springdale Park Playground, if you've been by Springdale Park lately, you've seen that there is some colorful new playground equipment that has been installed. Uh, come springtime, we'll get the surfacing installed and the ADA improvements installed to make the uh, new equipment accessible, um, and then that project will be wrapped up. Um, a completely brand new project is replacing the playground equipment at Mayor Field. Um, that has all been procured. We have a contractor lined up and that work is going to start in May of this year and be finished in advance of the summer season. Um, so, so those improvements will be in place as well as some other improvements to the gates and um, access to the park um, that have been a long, long standing concern at that location. Uh, Roberts Field Track, the replacement, full replacement of that track was funded by City Council this last fall. We made some short-term repairs to the track uh, to get through the, summer, through the spring track season, uh, but then we're hoping that uh, we'll be lining that up for a full replacement uh, sometime thereafter. Let's see, Jackson Court's handball improvements. There's a small project that's received community development block grant funding to make some improvements to the existing handball facilities at Jackson Courts. Um, and then targeting some things looking forward, the community field skate path. Uh, folks may know it's been shut down for the last two years now, partly because of COVID issues and partly because of corporate issues. Uh, we're looking ahead to planning for making any necessary improvements that need to be made to the to the basically the ice making equipment so that could be reactivated hopefully for next season. And then we're also supporting the uh, conservation and sustainability department on master planning for anniversary Hill Park. So there's there's a lot out there from a park standpoint. Um, public facilities, largely funded public facilities, meaning public buildings other than school buildings, um, largely funded through um, the ARPA program. Uh, we're looking at and we're in the process of designing these right now and some of these have gone out to bid. Um, looking at, at putting in new windows, uh, HVAC system upgrade, high efficiency boilers and an emergency generator at fire station number six on Homestead Ave. That's the city's oldest operating fire station. It was built in the mid 60s. Uh, so it, it's long overdue for some reinvestment in that facility. Fire station number three on Northampton Street, we're working on putting in new windows and HVAC equipment at that station. Uh, the windows are antiquated, they're not energy efficient, and they leak uh, tremendously. Uh, so we're looking to improve that facility. Uh, fire department headquarters, we're putting a new high efficiency boiler in to that facility to replace uh, the old cast iron boiler that was installed there. Good news, the Children's Museum. We are uh, getting under design for full replacement of the roof at the Children's Museum and the Basketball Hall of, excuse me, the Basketball, the Volleyball Hall of Fame, um, which has been problematic for quite a few years with having to patch leaks year after year. So that is slated to be designed and put out to bid and, and hopefully replace this construction season. Uh, the War Memorial Building, that was a city council appropriation to do a full replacement of the roof at the War Memorial Building, uh, which also suffers from 
a uh, very old antiquated roof system and the need to make repairs on a fairly regular basis to that roof. Uh, then in the City Health Annex, we're, we're tackling a lot of things that are long overdue. We're putting in a fire alarm system and emergency lights because the building currently lacks both of those capabilities. We're looking at replacing the skylights, replacing the roof of the building. Uh, then and once we get sort of the public safety or the, 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 the safety related and the envelope related improvements completed, then we'll be working inside of the building doing some carpet improvements, finish improvements and things like that. Um, similar scope at the DPW facility down in Canal Street. Uh, we're looking at the roof and skylight improvements there and then working um, interior to make some improvements where the in, in the office areas of the building there. City Hall, uh, we do have some funding appropriated for some uh, carpet and finish improvements, some HVAC and air quality improvements on a limited scope, some roof and some window improvements as well at City Hall where there have been a couple of areas that are problematic. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you so much, Alicia and Bob. Um, and I, I don't know, Alicia, if just quickly, if you want to share a little bit about how, you know, as far as public assistance is concerned, um, you know, how, how can they get a hold of you and... and Absolutely. Um, so I'll be brief on this section. Um, this office maintains about, right now we have about 45 contracts uh, with providers here in the city. We, when I was doing reviewing the list of uh, contracts, we have a service for near for nearly every sector of our population. So whether you are a veteran looking for transportation or a lunchtime meal, if you are a family looking for a child's care slot, if you're an elder um, feeling like you are isolated in your home with COVID and you would like to access a Chromebook, um, if you are a parenting teen and want to return to school, if you have young children and you're concerned about their mental health, um, if you are a domestic violence survivor or living in a situation where there's domestic violence in your home, whether you want job training, PPE, test kits for COVID, um, rental and mortgage assistance, or you need food access, we have a service for you. So I would encourage uh, households that if you are in need, please reach out to our office. We're at 413 322-5610. I would also take a look at the City of Holyoke's website at www.holyoke.org. A lot of this information is on there, but we have providers here in the city who are ready, able, and well-funded to assist regardless of what your need is. This office doesn't provide those services, but we partner and we fund the agencies who are, who are more than capable of um of helping you and so there is no need if you are in arrears on your rent or your mortgage please reach out the city has received through our office over 50 million dollars in the last two years to respond to covid so the resources are there the services that are there and we've been strategic about our allocations to ensure that every sector of the community um, that those needs are met so please reach out um, and I think I'll, I'll turn it over now to, to the mayor for a closing. So, and, and Johan, if, if you have any questions at all, you want us to expand on any of this, please feel free. I know it's certainly a lot that's being thrown out at the moment. And the goal here was just to give enough so that it gauges public interest. And if any member of the public has any questions about any of these projects we discuss, and this is just a little bit from a whole lot more. I mean, we can go on and talk about all the really neat different projects that have been funded through ARPA. You heard a little bit now, and there are certainly other uh, ARPA supported projects that are being worked on by uh, community organizations. Um, there's a great deal of uh, uh, different infrastructure projects um, that, you know, as you heard, um, that we're all working on. And again, I'm hoping that members of the public can understand and, and get an opportunity to hear that what projects are being worked on and and if, if, if anyone wants to reach out and ask questions in any particular one, always feel free to reach out to the mayor's office, to Alicia. Uh, don't reach out to Bob because Bob has uh, got his plate full. <laughs> or you can reach out to Bob. That's okay. He spoke to already. <laughs> there we go. Uh, uh, one of the major areas of, of um, uh, concern on our end 
as we go forward to implement these exciting projects is always around um, uh, capacity. There's a lot that we're working on here internally to be flexible as possible to keep up with these projects. Uh, certainly retention um, uh, is an area of concern as well. You know, folks come in and they leave and we have to post and find new folks um, to take on projects. And so those are just some things that, um, you know, we try to put our heads together internally to understand, you know, how do we become, how do we maintain uh, uh, competitiveness uh, in these areas? And, and, you know, how do we uh, uh, be creative and how we move things around to um, uh, keep up with these projects? So um, uh, there's certainly things we're working on to keep up with that. Uh, but yeah, Johan, if there's any questions at all and anything you wanted to expand on, uh, you know, Alicia and Bob that are here, feel free to ask away. Well, uh, as you mentioned, Mayor, is uh, a lot of information that, that is uh, being put. And I think this helps us to have sort of a timeline throughout the next months about follow up on some of this project that we will start seeing coming to fruition and to see the steps of, of its evolving process, like the the South Holyoke homes or the paving on South Holyoke or the implementation of the different measures to have um, better roadways. Uh, and of course, uh, all the opportunities for housing and services available to, to the residents. There was one point that uh, related to the roadways and a service that residents, some of them are utilizing, some others may not be aware of, and it's particularly the online tool called uh, Click Fix as a way to report some uh, potholes or different things happening in the roads that uh, need of, of attention and, and to be uh, addressed. How this is right now the status of, of the click fix tool and how can people let the city know of some needs regarding safety on the roads? Hey, uh, Bob or Alicia, do you? So I, I can me. jump in here. Um, so see click fix uh, was a program that was initiated a number of years ago. Um, that provides an online portal where residents can uh, access the online portal and make a complaint, whether it's a barking dog or a pothole or a neighbor's house um, that might have trash in the yard. So I think the C-Click Fix is a perfect example of what the mayor described around capacity. Um, C-Click Fix was a great opportunity when the mayor's office was fully funded with a staff of five. Um, and we had someone that could act as a point person. At this point, uh, C-Click Fix is bouncing between departments and we're trying to make sure that new complaints that are posted are resolved, um, but the mayor's office is in the, is in the process of reviewing it and, and trying to make a determination on whether it's the best portal or not. If someone is posting on C-Click Fix and not seeing a response, um, I certainly would reach out directly to the mayor's office um, and you know, send Nilka in, in the mayor's office an email to try to follow up. Um, government is government does really great things in some areas, and then there's some areas like technology where government is still still trying to catch up. And I think C Click Fix, to be honest, is is one of those um, that we're not doing as great a job as we should. Um, Bob, do you have any involvement these days in C Click certainly. Fix? Yes, I do. The the uh, certainly C Click C Click Fix is still active. And as I understand it, I haven't actually used it myself. I see, I see the output of it, but I believe you can tag the DPW. And when you tag the DPW with a complaint or an issue, that, that, that issue is automatically routed to several different people in the department via email. Uh, the ones that formerly went to the director of the Public Works, Mike McManus, I now monitor. Uh, so through his email system, I'm getting them and on a real-time basis forwarding them on to people that need to know uh, so that system from a pothole complaint standpoint is still very much active. We unfortunately have seen quite a few, um, uh, uh, not complaints, but uh, notifications lately. And I encourage people to do it because we want to know where there's a problem. There's 138 miles of street. We can't be watching every single mile of the street. We do have problem areas that we know about East Hampton Road. We know about, we know that Hamden and Lincoln Street and other places because of the age of the roadways, you know, are 
going to be a problem, but there are other areas that we don't know about that we need the public's help in terms of in terms of alerting us to problems that happen. So we it is active, we do monitor it, and we do respond to it. And if, if somebody isn't um, familiar with C Click Fix or they prefer to uh, to you know to use a more old fashioned approach, call the DPW uh, main number. And if you don't get a person, if you're calling in at night, leave a message. That line is monitored, um, and people do respond. I think this is a really important information to know, uh, especially when uh, when the mayor mentions the the need for for capacity and understanding that there are many great things happening. There are also challenges, and those challenges are being addressed right now. And this is the way we can get to let the public know how can be a teamwork between government and constituents and residents in the city to work together for the betterment of the city of Holyoke. I really want to thank your efforts, the time to share this information that is valuable and important, and also to invite you to continue having these conversations. I think this is a really important set of information that will give a better understanding of what is happening right now, how funds are being utilized, and for people to get a better appreciation of the work being done and to get involved as well. I want to thank our guest in this conversation today about the projects happening in the city of Holyoke. Mayor Joshua Garcia, the director of the Office for Community Development for the city of Holyoke, Alicia Zoller, and the City of Holyoke engineer, Robert Parent. Thank you for being here with us today, sharing this important information for the public and everything related to what is happening in different aspects and projects for the City of Holyoke. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.